Well, I think, I think we'll just kick straight in, right? Well, here we are. <laughs> Welcome to the Pagey Train. Today I have in the studio with me, Darren Lim, composer, um, all-round awesome dude. Welcome to the show. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's good being here. <laughs> yeah, man, we were just talking about, um, you know, uh, that transition between uh, having pirated software going over to, you know, um, non-pirated software, well, licensed software, I suppose it's a proper way to say it. <laughs> Um, and, uh, yeah, cause I've had a few hacked versions of like, uh, Final Cut Pro, uh, yeah. Premiere Pro. Yeah. Um, the one that was really hard to get a crack of was, uh, Pro Tools. Of course. Pro Tools was super hard. <laughs> I got it done. Oh, uh, right. But it wasn't a, well, a good performer though. Oh, right. Um, well, yeah, I mean, cause they're also expensive and, mm. you know, it be, when I was a student, you couldn't, you couldn't get them. Like you couldn't get like a full version of Pro Tools, mm. um, or Cubase or anything like that. So well, Cubase you can get LE, which was the light, can, the light version can, of it. Didn't but, have a lot of options. So. But as a student, like when I was, kind of you know, finding my bearings, so to speak. Mm. Um, you know, I didn't want to spend any money. You, you know, what if I spent like hundreds of dollars on on Logic or Cubase, and then I just didn't like it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, because you can't just sample it right exactly, and go, oh, yeah. I love this bit of software. But then you go, actually, I hate yeah. this software. Well, back then, their their free trials was like a week or something. Mm. I don't know. But but, but now it's like a month yeah, or something like enough. that. But like back then, um, it wasn't long for you to kind of get used to the whole kind of software. Um yeah, they did yeah. take a while. Hey, just pull your chair in a little bit, man. You yeah, look, sure. you're, you're, yeah. drifting, you're drifting away again. You're drifting away. Come, okay, come cool. on in, bro. Come on in. Right. Come on in. It's uh, <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's cozy here on the Pagey Train. Right. We're in we're in the engine room of ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Um, the Pagey Probably Train of thing. thought, if you will. Um, yeah, and bring that a bit closer. Yeah, yeah. There. Bring it a bit closer. There we right, go. Cool. Now we now we're happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, no, there was certainly access was an issue for software earlier, but I think it's gotten better. It's definitely gotten better. Yeah, it's gotten better. Um, a lot of the companies are just offering free, you know, free subscriptions as mm -hmm. well. You don't have to uh, pay for the full um, software like Photoshop. Mm. Yeah, um, I've always used like a crack ver version of uh, Photoshop until I found I found that they they've done like a subscription for all of their software per month. It's like yeah. I think it's like twenty five or thirty bucks. Well, no, um, I got no. It was way more yeah. expensive than that. I found it, yeah, because I had Premiere yeah. Pro, uh -huh. and I think I was getting like seventy bucks a month. That gave me Final, uh, sorry, um, Photoshop, um, mm -hmm. Bridge, and oh, um, right. Premiere yeah. Pro, and I'd only use Premiere Pro like thirty uh, percent of the time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I was in Premiere Pro, uh, because like, are you a hotkeys guy? Do, like, are you big on the hotkeys? Um, yeah, for Cubase. Yeah, you have yeah. to be. Yeah, it's just yeah. ease of e ease of um, work, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would take the hotkeys from Final Cut and then apply it to Premiere. Oh right, because I'm just yeah. so versed in it. Uh -huh. It's a second language. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's all muscle memory as well. Mm. It's just second nature to you, you know, at the end, and um, you know, it really speeds up your workflow and all that kind of stuff. For sure, so, for sure. Um, I always said like it's like a language. Edit, like, I feel it in my hands. Like I can actually edit faster than I can talk. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah for cool. sure. Yeah. It's insane. I, I had um, a big shout out to um, a big uh, a friend of mine, uh, Luke Walker. Um, he was uh, watching me do a um, uh, an interview mm -hmm. uh, edit, and I um, because I've shot the interview. If I've shot the interview, for instance, doing like the pagey train, I used to um, instead of doing a live um, edit of it, I used to edit it in post. Yeah, and I do it as a live cut. And um, because I've already watched it, I've already done an hour of the pagey train, right? I don't want to yeah. do another hour in real time of something I've just literally shot. Yeah, yeah. So I learned how to edit at speed times two. So I would, because you're doing a live cut, you can yeah. just go camera one, camera two, camera one, camera two, okay. right? So I would hit the, because the fast key for um, fast to play and final cut is L. So if the f more you push L, so one L mm -hmm. is times one. Yeah, right. Two L's times two, four Eight, sixteen, thirty-two, right? Mm -hmm. And I would edit at times two. He goes, "What the fuck, man? Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? You're you're editing at at times two speed." I go, "Yeah, but that means I'll get the edit done in half an hour rather than an hour. I've already shot it. I already know what the content is. I don't plan to cut any out. I just need to do the camera one, camera two. And yeah, he he, he rings me up and he goes, "Man, I totally adopted that, eh? Like, oh, really? Yeah, for yeah, sure. So, so that's a thing now. Yeah. Well, I didn't know it was yeah, a right. thing." 
Oh, right. That's just okay, the thing cool. that I do. I imagine other editors do it. Ah, um, yeah. But uh, I don't know if I can coin it and claim it mine, but it's just something that I certainly do do. I do do. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, I... Yeah, I just that's that's where those hot keys and finding ways to um, do faster work. Ah, uh, right. Because it's a big part of it, right? Because yeah. like doing music composition, like uh-huh. how many like channels do you run while doing a composition? Um, well, it really depends on the piece, but there's always, you know, if you have a template, there's always like, like twenty to thirty kind of tracks uploaded already. Mm. You know, so you're always kind of um, messing around with like 20 to 30 kind of different instruments so it depends on your on on your brief mm. you know because uh, sometimes you get given a, an orchestral brief and then mm. you open up your orchestral template yeah and um that's you know already th- 200 to uh, 300 tracks what yeah on uh, a line or like sorry. on an edit line um or are you talking about individual clips are you talking about like lines of data that are on the edit line well, on, you know, like your page sequencer, like in Logic or Cubase, you have your tracks loaded. Yeah. Um, so it, they're, they're all ready to go, like yeah. 250 to 300, all ready to go because, you know, um, there's there could be 60 to 100 instruments in an orchestra. Holy shit, dude. Yeah, but, but then... I always thought it was like yeah. 30. Like when I think um, of an orchestra, I think of 30, but you're talking like a full orchestra, like... Yeah, with... Three cellos, three violins, a lead violin. Well... It's well, their sections is is kept into like one kind of track, mm. but then each track has like different articulations. Okay. So you have like um, long strings or short strings. Okay. You know, um, I'm gonna use some musical jargon. You know, yeah, sure, there, sure, there, sure. There's like you know, you want staccato strings in one track and then spiccato in another. Yeah. Because you might want to you know, um, EQ them differently. Yeah. You know, that's three three tracks. Mm-hmm. It, it it all builds up. Um, because there's so many different families of the orchestra. You got the percussion, woodwinds, strings. Um, you got a piano, harp. But but that's just you know. Well, that's for an or- that's for a score. Right? Yeah, that's, that's for like a score. an orchestral. Or- yeah. Or- 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 orchestral. Yeah. Orchestral? Yeah, but for for something like Campesinos, um, mm. I had a winner of uh, uh, the Made in the West uh, <laughs> um, uh, Composition Award, by the way, for Campesinos. Congratulations. Oh, right. Yeah. Um. Well, shout out to Matthias. You know, he, he gave me that brilliant canvas to work on um and a super cool dude oh yeah a super cool dude big shout out yeah for sure um i think that was like around 25 30 tracks Mm -hmm. um of all these different ambient kind of sounds so yeah i mean with music composition there's always so many tracks for you to kind of be on top of Mm -hmm. um so Mm -hmm. i certainly couldn't do what what you what you do like oh really it it, you you know um fine tuning it you know at double the speed it's, um... oh, I don't know if we can achieve that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, doing doing it in double time for music, I think that would be confusing for sure. Um, oh yeah, it, it it would mess with the vibe. I mean, you know, playing mm. campesinos on double time, <laughs> you know, it's, it just wouldn't be right. Turbo orchestra. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. Maybe there's a market for it. Maybe there's a market for it. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, it was a really good track, man. Like, I think you did, a, yeah. Obviously, you did a fantastic job on that, on that, on that gig, you know, because um, it's pretty. Like, you're one of the guys that um, inspired Made in the West for for composition, man. All oh, right. Yeah, totally. There's there's a there's a um, Anisha. Another shout out to Anisha. Um, you know, th- th- there's composers out there that I think it's the sort of unclaimed art. They're right next. To, composers for me are right next to editors. Yeah. No one knows a good editor. Yeah. Because if you see bad editing, you go. Well, that's terrible. Mm-hmm. If you see good editing, you don't go, oh, that was good editing. Yeah, exactly. You, you don't yeah. point it out, yeah. right? Yeah. It's yeah. the same with composition. It's sort of this unrecognized art. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But without it, um, well, it, no, let me go another direction with it. With it, and it really enhances absolutely everything. You're talking about emotional context and, and anchoring ideas that are with the visual context, right? Mm-hmm. And it's such a specific art. And I, 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 it's the same again with Foley doing Foley yeah. work for a movie. Yeah. No one knows what the hell it is. Yeah, they yeah. just they just accept it as part of um, content that they, they they take in, right? Um, but yeah, it was guys like you that were like, man, we need to put an award up for these guys um, right. to give yeah. them recognition mm-hmm. because yeah, it's the same with the sound design as well. Sound mm-hmm. design. Yeah. 
um, as well as like um, uh, production design is another one that's overlooked. Yeah. Dressing yeah. a set and making everything in its place and having that continuity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. another thing that's overlooked. Uh, so it's really good to recognize that because film is like this intersection of all these arts. Yeah. Like you just talked about doing an edit across Logic over 200 tracks, mm -hmm. 200 channels that are a part of that composition. That was par probably part of a, um, a sound design that probably had, you know, 30 to 40 uh, layers. Yeah, well, I think sound design usually has a lot more. Mm. It, it, it depends on a film, I guess, but... Um, you know, Especially the final product, yeah. Oh, yeah. When well, you get towards the end of the edit, yeah. Well, for anything like animation or um, anything sci-fi, because mm. they, they have to create that world, mm. you know. Um, you, if, if you're watching Frozen, you know, uh, a, a lot of people wouldn't say, oh, that's great sound design, because when they watch it, they watch the world for, for what it is. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, they won't know necessarily that um, some guy has spent five hours on... You know that wave. You know, yeah, that totally. sound of the water. Yeah, you get or, what I mean. Yeah, but even just ambience. Um, yeah, yeah. I did this. Um, I, I did this. Uh, um, workshop for um, uh, uh, this group called Hack Sounds. Big shout out to Helmut actually. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, Helmut goes up to me. He goes, well, he doesn't go up to me. He, you know, rang me, and uh, mm -hmm. he, he said, "Look, I'm doing this um, workshop." about uh for deaf people yeah and they're doing music production and they're using these different um sensory um devices to identify sound to do music yeah. composition I yeah go, man that's some wild shit man that's some wild ideas in that and he goes what i want you to do man I, i've got this problem for you i need i need to have an idea on how to edit um sound as a deaf person or someone that's a deaf uh, someone that's, uh, that can hear teaching a deaf person or someone that's hard of hearing mm -hmm how to edit film sound i'm like whoa do you understand what you've just yeah. asked yeah well that's a it, that's a difficult problem bro yeah you know? yeah but um i started thinking about it I, started, I said leave it with me for a couple of days man and let me rattle around in my noodle for a little bit and i'll have a think about it and i thought you know a lot of sound editing is actually done by visual cue they're, they're not not mm -hmm. a lot but there is if you remove your ears from the situation and when you try to marry sounds you actually look at Sound peaks, and you go. Yeah. Well, there's the beat, right? Yeah. And this is where the the scene changes. So you go. Well, I I can actually use as I'm doing sound editing, I'm actually using visual cues to do it too. So then I start thinking about. It, I go. You could take a whole Foley li library and make it a video clip rather than a sound clip, and put visual cues in the video. For instance, if it's footsteps, put a picture of feet. Yeah. And every time a footstep happens, put a flash. So that they can see okay. that feed, no, the sound of uh, um, uh, feed are happening. And it was just this experimental space. Like, I didn't know if it was going to be successful or not. But the thing that blew me away when I did this workshop um, with these hard of hearing and um, uh, deaf sort of, uh, sort of people, right? Um, with these folk, they were, they were blown away by me describing a soundscape. And this is the thing I didn't see happening. Yeah. Well, I had this idea of... <laughs> How can I be helpful and solve this strange problem? And it's something that's so outside of what my understanding is. Um, I, I, I targeted in this visual reference way. But then to understand that, I had to describe soundscapes to deaf people that have never really heard sound. They, they may have had um, devices that allowed them here before. And uh, I was describing ambience. And I said, what is ambience? I'm like, whoa, okay. I wasn't it predicting that question as a part of the tutorial. I said, well, the ambience is more like the sea. Think of the sea. All the sounds of the fish. Well, you've got sharks, you've got, you know, dolphins. But ambience is the ocean itself. It's, it's what all the sounds are embedded in. It's the room tone. Mm -hmm. And they were blown away by this idea of room tone. Because like, they've never heard room tone. No yeah. one's ever explained what the fuck room tone yeah, is. Yeah. And I said, well, there's, it's like this soup of sound. Like, fridges hum, wind blows, uh, rain rain falls. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, they were just, they, yeah, that just totally blew me away by talking to people that didn't have that experience with sound. They had a physical experience with sound by feeling vibrations and... and um, uh, 
speaking through language through the use of their hands or lip reading using visual cues for absolutely yeah. everything mm. while trying to write music and i go well that's a that's an insane endeavor i really appreciate it and i thought wow man that's 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 fucking cool um but it totally blew me away to describe a soundscape to someone to understand that you've got dialogue foley um sound effects ambience music scoring even even dialogue splits up you'd have what's on screen versus narration mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh I, I spun one of them away they were like uh, i call it the god radio so when you hear scoring yeah like what you do mm -hmm. the people in the film don't hear the score no they wouldn't yeah no. it's not a part of the experience that they're having it's actually an audience experience it's this different dimension when you do foley it's very much the sounds that they would experience and it really started to make me think about like you've blown me away like, like when i think about orchestras i think about 40 channels because that's the limit of my understanding about it yeah right yeah. and then you think about well go well if you break that down further to someone that has that kind of disadvantage about how they would think about the world they have these other channels that they think about it and i just you talking now i think about well how can you merge all of that together there must be a way to do that i just find that profound um but um we, we, you all, just to change the subject as well you also recently won um, best composition for Operation Kung Flu. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, big shout out, obviously, to Maria Tran. I hope you're watching. Um, uh, I, I did see a subscription there the other day, so thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but that was a bit of different work for you, yeah? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that was way different than Campesinos. Like, um, Campesinos was very much um, like an ambient type of scoring. You, you're, well, for me, I scored you know, the Patagonian landscape, you know, so, you know, so I was trying to mimic, you know, the winds and the snows, um, mm -hmm. through, you know, aerophones and, and strings and all these kind of synth synthesized kind of sounds. But with Kung Fu, uh, Kung Flu, Kung Flu, uh, Operation Kung Flu, um, it was very much playing with the comedy, mm. you know, um, and since, you know, the whole film had this kind of nostalgic 80s, 90s kind of vibe, I had to use that kind of production um, and also that kind of language. Um, so it it was, you know, it was way different than, than scoring, you know, um, campesinos or anything similar. Um, I kind of went, fi like, I don't know, I just kind of went, you know, stupid with it. I was like, I just just do anything and not not anything like. Just have the time the time is yeah. a bit different, right? Because like when you're doing ambient stuff, or well, not necessarily ambient, but you you're synchronizing to the environment mm -hmm. uh, for for realism. Cause that's what you're trying to tackle is that real realism and perhaps like emotional in, in, invocation, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and but also, comedy timing yeah. is different, right? Oh, it's way different. I mean, with Campesinos, there was like a certain narration as well. Mm. So I, I was kind of scoring to what they're talking about. Um, so in context, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a bit different, isn't yeah. it? And I never thought about it that way. Yeah. and But with, yeah, with Operation Kung Flu, it's all um, comedic timing, like, like you said. So, mm. you know, finding the right beats to emphasize or de-emphasize situations mm. because, you know, irony is comedy mm -hmm. at the end. Um, and y you just got to do that with the music. You know, if, if there was something really dramatic happening on screen uh, and if if the score warrants you to de-emphasize it mm. you know like not be as dramatic with your score be kind of the opposite uh, that irony is is comedy I believe so yeah I think you did um, a fantastic job man I, I look I'm biased because I'm in the movie right <laughs> I've got a yeah. just, just disclaimer I'm in that no, I'm in that movie, kids. Uh, but, um, well, actually, with that said, I, I, at the start, I didn't want to be in that movie. Like, Maria oh. really had to convince me to do it. Oh, really? Yeah, because, <laughs> I, I, long story short, I'll try and tell the story really quickly. Uh, 2020, we had, like, COVID that started, and then the festival was running, and then we went through, like, you know, emergency planning in case a, yeah. a case happened in Liverpool while we're trying okay. to do our flagship event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, we went through all these issues, and there was no event, nothing happened. We got to do the festival. We actually, the cinema was really cool. They gave us two cinemas. We had 150 people in one, 150 people in the other. I could see mm. my batteries about to run dead. <laughs> this is killing me. All right, I've got to change that out before it happens, Wade. Can you push uh, stop on yep. uh, the main record? 
<laughs> Sorry, man. Josh Brolin? Rolling. All right. <laughs> yeah, so now we're back to Josh Brolin. Sorry, we had a, um, yep. a technical issue there. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, Maria Tran, right? So um, uh, when we were doing the festival in 2020, um, my producer forgot to push record on the sound recording device for each interview that I did at Made in the West. Oh. You know how we do the Made in the West <laughs> highlights video? Yeah, yeah. So I had the camera mic. I had the camera mic. Yeah. And... I go to I go to Misty. I go. I don't have the content. I've got the pictures, but I don't have the content. Like I can't publish camera mic. Yeah. It's just going to diminish our product. We can't yeah. do it. Yeah. And uh, she goes, "Oh man, we just have to let it go." And I go, "I can't let it go. I can't. Mm. I can't let it go." Oh, that was super dark. Now we're just gone. That's all right. I can't let it go. Um, so I decided to ADR. Yeah. <laughs> the whole clip. And the trippiest thing is, right, so I've done plenty of ADR before. Mm-hmm. When you do, like, theatrical stuff, ADR is really... Well, it's not really easy, but it's it's assisted, right? Because you've got a script. You've got the actor that played the role that they rehearsed over and over yeah. and over again. And you just got to get them to do it again. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not... It, that's... The, the biggest challenge is, you know, removing the rubber lips. You know, you need yeah. to get it yeah. synchronized with yeah. their lips, right? And you just get them to listen to themselves again. They've done it before. Doing live ADR is a whole different beast because then you've got people that aren't actors necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Responding to something that they said ad libbed whilst having a few beers at mm-hmm. a film festival. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. totally different beast. Oh yeah. So I had twelve interviews. So I had twelve people come over. So something that was a eight hour edit mm-hmm. turned into a thirty five hour edit. Okay. For a five minute film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> insane amount of work and I went through all of that and everyone and I released the f- the clip like four months late because I had to schedule everyone to come in and Maria came over and I was doing the ADR with her and she was really stoked with it and she's like man you, you got a really good voice Ross I go well I do voice acting man that's mm-hmm. what I do yeah yeah. and um, she goes I need a voiceover can you do a voiceover for me I'm like yeah sure um, I did the um, the American bad guy oh no so the American movie guy you know one yeah. man one yeah. desire yeah. yeah so I did that for her and then she came back over to do some more ADR and she's like, she noticed some nunchucks and like some weapons laying around in the studio. And she's like, do you know how to use these things? I'm like, yeah, man, I can use nunchucks. I can use size. It's like, this is something I do for fun. <laughs> now to do carters and stuff. And uh, she's like, I-, I want you to be in my movie, Ross. I'm like, you know, stop it. Cut it out. Like, yeah. thanks, for the- thanks for the flattery. Mm. Uh, but, you know, you- you'll find someone that can actually do the job for you. She's like, no, no, no. I need you to do it. And I said, no. I said, no. I said, no, no, no. So she rings me, rings me a couple of days later. And I'm like, I, ne- I want you in this movie, Ross. I'm like, okay, you're obviously really serious. Um, I'm a background actor. I'm not the. I'm a voice actor. I'm a foley artist. I don't. I, I direct movies. I, I, I don't be on the screen. Anyway, she goes. We'll do three weekends of fight choreography. We'll rehearse the film and we'll go shoot the film. So she convinces me to do it. And essentially, basically, that film ends with me getting my ass handed to me by uh, Maria Tran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> essentially. And um, yeah, I th- that comic timing, that's something I found the biggest challenge is getting those peak points and getting the timing right for the delivery. Never learned the edit. I didn't, obviously didn't do the edit, but um, getting that those points right was super hard. And I could see even directing comedy is super hard. But actually, big shout out to um, Matthew C. Vella. Uh, if you're listening to this, I know that um, uh, you're a bit indisposed, man, and I've been thinking of you, and we absolutely love you. So we're seeing out a lot of love. Um, but um, he's a guy that I've, I've seen do that comic timing. This like he did. He, I think he took it to another level um, uh, with a film called um, um, "She's Not Your Type." And it was just an onslaught. By the time that you're laughing at the the first joke. Another five jokes have happened that have, you yeah. know, making your stomach hurt, right? Just an absolute barrage of timing. But, um, yeah, I think comedy is the most scariest film that you can do. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but what's your origin story, man? Were you always going to be in composing? Oh, um, no, uh, I don't think so. Well, I think, I think, oh, no, I'm fine. I'm good. Yeah. Um, no, I think I'm, I've always had, an interest of it, but I never really acknowledged it. Okay. If that makes sense. Um, so, like, in high school, um, you know, I I was listening to 
the Dark Knight, you know, all of um, Hans Zimmer kind of stuff. Mm. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that that was before that was before that whole craze. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, true. yeah. So that's I was, true. I was listening to like his Batman stuff, and um, what was the other one? The Last Samurai. The Last Samurai, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was like around 2000, 2008. Uh, I would listen to it when I'm when I'm studying and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And, what were you studying at the time? I was in high school. Oh, okay, yeah, high school, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I was in high school. Wait, I just felt I just all of a sudden became super old. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, what was it? Um, I was I was kind of you know get, getting serious with performance. So I was you know I well, when I went to AIM, I, I majored in bass guitar. So I you know I had had a goal of being the best, you know the best I can with, with the bass guitar and then mm. just um, it's an unusual it. instrument to pick up though yeah a lot of guitarists migrate from being a guitarist or a bass guitarist it's strange to start out in bass yeah well yeah I just I just went straight to bass and um, you know I, I wanted to become like um, Marcus Miller or something like that you, okay. know, you get what I mean like um, just just to groove on a bass and all that kind of stuff so I think it was the Marcus Miller. That's Primus, yeah. Is that Primus? No, that's Les Claypool. Les Claypool, that's right. Les Marcus Miller is a is he's a jazz musician. Okay. Yeah. Wow, I got really I got that really mixed up. <laughs> Jeez, that's totally different. No, no, it's all good. Uh, but <laughs> I do love Les Cape Claypool. Yeah. though. you know, yeah. Matthias played bass as well. Really, another bass guitarist. Yeah. Um, Man, you guys are so fucking rare. <laughs> How do I find two bass guitars without knowing it? You know. Well, it's. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> guitarist and vocalist are a dime a dozen, right? Yeah, yeah. Drummers and bass guitarists are really hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think Matthias might hate me for telling this story, but like he, because me and Matthias went to school together. Mm. Uh, when I, I think when I was in year twelve, he was in year ten. Oh, he might have been year nine. Honest. Correct me, Matthias. Uh, Put it in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he he, I I remember the first time I met Matthias, I had to, because I was in a school band. Uh, Petition Brothers Fairfield. Mm-hmm. I was in a school band, so I was I was there from year nine to year twelve, and then as I was leaving, you know, finishing my HSC, I needed to teach someone to take over like my spot, mm. um, and that was Matthias. He was playing the bass, okay. so that's how I kind of met him the first time, and then the second time was when I think he had an interest in doing some lessons with me. Mm. So I think we did like one or two lessons and then he stopped. <laughs> so maybe I was a crap teacher or something. But um, <laughs> Should have put the time in, Matthias, you know. <laughs> More dedication, bro. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but Just kidding, bro. Just kidding. Yeah. We love uh, So, you know, we, we had this dream, which is, you know, becoming like the best basic starters in the world and all that kind of stuff. And then the second year of AIM, you know, was when I was... What's uh, AIM? A- uh, the Australian Institute of Music. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was when I stumbled across that cracked version of... Um, it was Sibelius, actually. Okay. And I've heard of that one. It was. It's a notation software. It's not a sequencer. Okay. So um, you, you, you just write up scores, like the actual notes and all that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. So you don't, yeah. you don't actually play the music into it. No, You no, no. write the music into it yeah, and then yeah. it plays it back to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Like this kind of shitty MIDI... Okay, so yeah. a sequencer is something that you'd play music into. Well, yeah, a sequencer, you have all these other parameters like VSTs and, you know, creative effects. You can mm-hmm. do it like, you know, you can write music in, into it, like yeah. Logic or Cubase. But like Sibelius, Sibelius and, you know, Finale, you actually input the notes to print out scores. Wow. If that makes I sense. I didn't even yeah. know that was so, a thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's definitely a thing. And Wow. So that was my first kind of software bespoke to making music so that's how i kind of fell into it mm. and then i kind of liked it and then it just grew from there so, so it's just same rolled from there yeah, yeah it's funny how things like that happen isn't it like i got into making film because i wanted to be a foley artist mm-hmm. and i ended up directing movies and filming movies and then it was only I, it took me a really big journey to get back to the foley yeah, right. And I eventually yeah. got back to it. But mm-hmm. it took a couple of years. It was about six years before I'd done any Foley. As a, as a young filmmaker, I was, you know, you go and do everything that you can, you know, the corporate videos or the, you know, the shitty little commercial that yeah. anyone will give me the budget and time to do. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but uh, yeah, there's no foley involved in that. And then all of a sudden, uh, someone mentioned, you're like, oh, do, you, do you like doing foley? I'm like, well, I have a very strong understanding of it because I've researched it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I haven't actually, I'd only ever made two foley productions before my first foley gig. And then I did my first foley gig and they're like, oh man, can you get, you know, they just it's referral after referral after referral. And the thing that I do most of in foley is the repair because when people do like, um, you know, they, they do a sound recording of their film, there might have been a windy day and yeah. they have one break, yeah. you know, just maybe 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. It would only just be 20 seconds of the film that they need. And you know, it's kind of like doing um, plaster work on a wall. That's the way I look at it. It's like yeah. there's a yeah. gap in the wall yeah. and you just need to plaster it over and then paint yeah. it so mm-hmm. it matches the rest of the wall. Yeah. And yeah. it's the same with the soundscape, right? You can't just f- repair the sound and have this one thing sticking out that's clearly been repaired you need to smooth it over and make it blend with the rest of the the content Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i started doing that and and then i realized holy shit that's why i started doing that degree i totally forgot about it (laughs) totally forgot about my ambitions to why i got into film Mm -hmm. because like you know i was i was a guy in my 20s that um when dvds were popular i had wall-to-wall dvds in my house Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um people like man you own a lot of fucking dvds man i'm like I love movies, man. Like, no one... I can quote most movies before, you know, 2005. From about, you know, 1975 to 2005. I can quote most movies that are iconic right. from start to end. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, well you know, I, I had the same upbringing as well. Like, I, I love the movies. I've always watched the movies. Um, it's pretty much what, you know, me and my mum did. Yeah, it was me and my mother as well. For, you yeah, it, yeah. For, for ages. Yeah, so, I, I guess to add to my... <laughs> What you call it the origin story? Uh, I think, I think um, I've always kind of had this love for film, even more than music. Mm. Yeah. So that's as a storyteller, though, that's the thing that I fell in love with is the storytelling, right? Yeah. 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 Um, I really well, enjoy it. Ca- kind of this. Well, I, I fell in love with the the escape that it provided. I think. Really. Yeah. Well, that's that's what movies are, though, right? Yeah. It's an escapism. Like I remember, there's certain movies in the points of my life that were either um, climactic in the sense that of, of achievement where I'd won something or I'd uh, um, you know you know finished high school or, or whatever and there's movies that I go that was uh, that movie came out at a time where I'd won there's these other movies that are out there where life was really sad horrible and you know as life gets yeah and I remember the movies that were released at that time and th- there's one movie in particular like I was having a bad time as a teenager and there's mm-hmm. one movie that I escaped on a lot and that was True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger oh wow <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> yeah it was just it, it was ju- it just so happened that that's the movie that was made yeah. at that time it yeah, wasn't right. specific to the genre or anything like that okay it was yeah. just a movie that was, it was out of the cinema at the time and and because I didn't have a lot of cash back then I'd had um Lots of nefarious ways of yeah, getting into yeah. a cinema. <laughs> um, I suppose the nefarious ways that we get into cinema these days is like, hey man, can I borrow your uh, Netflix Netflix login? You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah or, something like that. or just walk straight up into a cinema. Yeah, <laughs> let's, yeah, just walk in like I own the joint. I actually had it worked out. There was one yeah. cinema, and a big shout out to my year six teacher, Mr. Paul Hughes. Uh, I was uh, one of his first students as a year six teacher. I think he ended up being a prime, uh, prime minister. Shit, we haven't got that far. <laughs> uh, a, a, a principal at uh, a school just just locally, and he also uh, moonlighted as a, um, a ticket salesman at the um, mm-hmm. at the cinema. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I I must say I he because we went on a tour through the cinema, and I figured out where the weak points were to get into the movies. Yeah. <laughs> and my weak point was if you manage to get up into the disabled hallway, which accesses all of the cinemas. We need to do is get in that hallway and call the lift up, and you can bring your friends up with you. <laughs> and we'd go and sneak in any movie you yeah. wanted. You used to do it all the time. I used to sneak into movies. I remember sneaking into um, Pulp Fiction, nineteen ninety-seven, oh, right. man, because I was, well, it was more than ninety-six actually. I can't remember. Hey Wade, can you look that up for me, bro? When was Pulp Fiction? When did that come out? Um, <laughs> I went because I want to know how old I was when I did this. Because I want to know how mischievous I was. Release date of Pulp Fiction. Um, <laughs> Um, and uh, I remember sneaking into that movie because everyone said it's an over 18s movie you're not allowed to go to it I'm like but you know oh 94 94 <laughs> I was 14 when I snuck into that movie 14 put that to have you put that to the line Wayne put that to the line yeah 1994 bro Jesus I was 2 years old <laughs> <laughs> I was 14 I was 14 then 
Um, yeah, holy shit, man. I was 14 when I snuck into that movie. You little bastard. All right. Um, I remember going to that movie, but I'd seen other things like, I remember Total Recall had come out, and that's a violent movie. Like Total Recall, that's 89, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a super <laughs> were, violent movie. You were even younger. Yeah, I was, it would have been nine years old when I saw the yeah. R-rated version of that. Yeah. But my parents were fine with that, and they're like, well, they went, well, actually, they were okay with it. It's just that they realized that they couldn't take me to Pulp Fiction because I was 14. Yeah. But I snuck into it anyway. I wanted to go. Went, and for free. Thank you, Paul. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, uh, and my mates went. We actually took some beer with us. I was 14. I was drinking beer at 14. Shit. This explains so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, I, I I I definitely I think there's been a massive shift in how we take in film obviously. And I think things repeat themselves like mm. people used to watch the news in the cinema. They call it newsreels, right? Really? Yeah, totally, mm. man. Because if you go back before TV, mm -hmm. the only way you could see visual content was going in the cinema. It was the Lumiere brothers, actually. The rumor is, I don't know if it's true or not, but mm -hmm. th this is the, what they teach you at you know film school, right? Uh, Lumiere brothers, first guys to really get a camera and start to film shit, right? And they filmed a train oh, yeah. going past them. Yeah. Apparently, the people in the cinema were so blown away, they thought that the train was going to come yeah. through the cinema. Sounds like a really good story. But I think it's bullshit. I think... I, <laughs> I don't know. Well, that same story, um, my film music teacher taught me as well. Mm. So, I, I think it's pretty, oh, pretty real enough. Oh, I, I think, but I think it's just a story that film teachers teach. Actually, I think there's a video on, on online. Of people running away? Yeah. Hey, Wade, look that up. <laughs> look that up. People running away from train and cinema. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll look that up. Um... Yeah, I think, uh, I don't know, they tell that story. Like, I know the film they're talking about. I've seen the film that they're talking about. There's this other guy, there was this other guy called uh, uh, Marvel, right? I think it was Marvel. And he was like a, um, like a Houdini kind of character. Yeah. Like um, uh, illusionist and uh, escape artist. And he figured out that film, he could do special effects to do um, artistic installations. Yeah. Of, and... It was inspired. Yeah, see, this is the film. I know that's the film. But that's, is that the line? Yep. Right. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, people ran away from that. See, I don't believe it. Well, it's I, gone pretty slow. Well, that's the Lumiere, the Lumiere's film, People Running Away From a Train. Is it? Is I, 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 I could have sworn I've seen a footage of someone sneaking in a camera. Can you can you hey, hey wait look that up so crowd running away from uh, train showing up uh, Lumiere try Lumiere Let's see if you can spell Lumiere for me bro <laughs> <laughs> um think French French dude train runs away <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't know it sounds like a really cool story but I just don't know if it's real. You know what I mean? Because it was, what, 1911 yeah, when that yeah, happened? Yeah, So, it's well over 100 years ago. Um, Lumiere. Oh, yeah. That's, that, they'll, that, they'll, they'll spell correct, yeah. There you go. That's the same video. That's it there. He's already put it up. Yeah, that's the same one. This one's in colour. Nah, it can't be in fucking colour. 1895. What the fuck? Oh. Yeah, no, we ain't getting into that. Um, yeah, but the, I'm telling you, man, that's the video. Like, I remember when I went to film school, I thought it was more impactful than that, but it's not. It's just this train that's going mm -hmm, by, mm -hmm. and apparently people ran out of the cinema. But I reckon, like, because when you think about hype, right, because you've got to build hype around a movie yeah. to get people to sell tickets, oh, right? right, okay. So you go, these people ran away from this <laughs> film because it's fucking terrifying, right? It's the same as um, when they released um, The Exorcist, right? So they did, um, when they did like, um, before The Exorcist and Jaws, mm -hmm. they didn't do national releases. And this is where, um, what do they call them? Uh, exploitation films come from. They would say, Bruce Lee's in this movie, come and see this movie. You go to the cinemas and you see Bruce Lee's on the, on the so you go, I want to see a martial arts film, I want to go see this film. Mm -hmm. uh, but Bruce Lee's only in it for two frames. So they call it exploitation film because you paid the money yeah. at the spot and you thought that you were going to go see a Kung Fu yeah. movie, but yeah. you actually got a B-rated you know, shitty film, right? Yeah. And uh, they, they call it 
exploitation films and then you got the Ozploitation films because there was the relationship between America and Canada and Australia where they're the only cultures that really had drive-in cinema mm-hmm. so you drive up to the cinema you got your date with you what movie are you going to watch there's no internet there's no yeah. knowing what was on at the cinema when you drove there you might have had an inkling in the paper from the week before mm-hmm. but that's about it mm-hmm. you'd walk up to a movie and um, they would say this is where Tarantino ripped off a lot of people. Or well, not ripped off, so you know, just being careful. I know, I know, I know. Um, but um, referenced yeah. a lot of films from the Ozploitation uh, mm-hmm. period. He'd even say that he coined that. But the idea was is that you'd go to a cinema. Well, not the idea, but what would happen is you go to a cinema, you see a poster, and you go and watch that movie. When Exorcist came out, it was broadcast nationally to go and see this movie they had lines around the block to go and see this movie right Mm -hmm. and they had stories that were out like people ran out of the cinema because it was so terrifying and if you the internet's not around you get word of mouth of this you go I've got to go and see this movie Yeah. yeah what made people so scared right and it was a public relations uh advertisement right so when I think about the Lumiere brothers and that that train scaring people off, I go, "That's a good uh, marketing strategy." I really, guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd do that. <laughs> I need to get people there, right? Um, by the way, you know, we also have the Audience Choice Award available at Made in the West. Um, bring your friends and get them to vote for your film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all exactly. marketing ploy, right? You got to get people in, and don't get me wrong, you want. You want people running out in the cinema because the movie is terrifying. Um, maybe not having a heart attack, you know, but you want people running out of the cinema because it's scary. Mm-hmm. But you want people to come into the cinema and buy a ticket and come see the content. So you need a little bit of hype. And I just, I'm a little bit suspect of the Lumiere brothers. I know people are going to cane me for that. And probably some of my uh, mentors in filmmaking are going to cane me for that. Because I go, but that's our teaching doctrine. That's how we do it. Um, but I just think, uh, yeah, a little bit of hype, a little bit of hype. Um, but what's, what's the aspirations for you going into the future? Because right, you've done, you've done like serious film, Campesinos, serious film, like a film that was subtitled, that won best film mm-hmm. at Maine the West. Um, the same year, I think, um, it was uh, also a Korean film that had won uh, a sub, first oh, yeah. subtitled Parasite. Parasite, that's mm-hmm. right. Parasite had won that year as well. And I've got a strange theory about that because like if you like if you rewind fifteen, twenty years, mm-hmm. you turn on SBS, all right, you see some naked people on the screen, you go, Okay, you've got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then the subtitles start and the clothes go back on, you're like, Yeah, what's on channel ten? <laughs> right? Subtitles will start up, you'd be like, I'm fucking out of here, man. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And that is a a total um, Anglo-Saxon way of thinking of things. I'm not going to read this because I don't have time and I need to look at it on the screen. But a lot of people these days watch f- films quietly at work, right? Like this is before COVID, right? Because mm-hmm. then you could watch closed captions and you can watch a oh, movie right. in secret. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Whether it was English or not, okay. you could watch a movie in secret. Mm-hmm. And because we're always like on social media reading, you know, posts and reading Twitter, reading um, posts on Instagram. I think that society got more um, close to the idea of reading content while watching it. Mm-hmm. And I think there was a changeover when that happened. And I was I found it really profound that it happened the same year. Like, Maine the West went through this shift, right? Because we've always got this pat on the back at Maine the West. Like, you know, it's great that you guys are diverse. It's great that you're inclusive. And, like, most of us are like, we don't do that. We're not inclusive. We're not diverse. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just show content. It just show happens the people that make that content yeah, yeah, are yeah. diverse and of a different background. We, 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 we didn't put this dude's movie up because it was in a foreign language. I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah. Was, we, we didn't actually care about that. It was actually a good movie. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why we, we gave it to the judges and the judges voted on it and they're going, that's a fucking good movie. That's why it's on the screen. Yeah. It's nothing yeah. to do with the dude that made it. It doesn't have nothing to do with the chick that made it. Yeah, yeah. Th- that's not the precursor here. The content is the precursor. Now, uh, you don't have to throw a stone so far in Western Sydney to find diversity. It's not hard. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, even people that you think aren't diverse, you'll find diversity in them. Like, it's fucking Australian, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, man. Yeah. It, like, even if you look at it from an original Australian point of view, first Australian's point of view, and everyone that's come afterwards... Everyone is diverse. 
Everyone has a everyone has a story. Yeah. And uh, that's the cool thing. Tell the story. Yeah. No one cares who you are. Just tell the story, man. Yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, I just found it really profound that there was this shift in society about accepting these ideas as standard, normal content. And I really saw the door just just swing open on it. And it's something that like we noticed as uh, that's why Main the West started, man. It started out of um, it started out of fighting against nepotism. It started out of rebellion. Like, we made a couple of films and we put it into... I won't mention the film festivals, but we put it into a few fil- film festivals, some of our films, and we're like, man, we've made a really good job here. Like, we're, we're in. We're fucking in. Didn't even get a mention. And then we went to go, oh, okay, obviously we are overconfident and we don't have an understanding of what's around us. And then we went to the film festivals to see what we got rejected from. We're like, fuck off. <laughs> this is bullshit. That film got in. <laughs> and our film's not in. Yeah, man, yeah. what's going on here? And you realise it's it's a it's a stigmatism, it's a postcode stigmatism, and and uh, so we go, well, fuck it, man, we'll we'll show our own shit. And the spin out thing that spins me out the most is like I remember um, there was a year that we had a surplus of films, like because uh, for the first five years of Made in the West, if you entered Made in the West, you pretty much are going to get in because mm-hmm. we're hungry for content. It's mm-hmm. hard to get people to submit your content. And there was one year that we go, shit, we've got double the amount of films. We can't show them all. We have to reject yeah, right. yeah. We have to reject these films because it's going to go to the judges. They're going to decide. Mm-hmm. Not everyone's going to get a show. That The following year after that, there was a group, um, I think they were in Campbelltown. They're like, screw these Made in the West dudes. We're putting our own festival on. Right. I'm like, that is hilarious. Because <laughs> the whole reason we started it was because of that exact reason, and they felt rejected. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I was trying to say, I tried to reach them and say, it's not, you didn't, it, you didn't make the festival, but if you did a film next year, and you did the same thing again, you'd do it better. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, there's a line. Yeah, and most of those guys were right up at the line. That there was that there was just a ten films that were better than theirs. Yeah, yeah. and that's the judges selected so, and oh, it was so hard to reach them, and uh, it was a different for me. It was a different it was a different optics on it, but the result was the same. It was these people that felt despondent. It was like fuck this man, we'll do our own fucking thing, <laughs> um, and I thought that was that was cool. Uh, but I, I managed to convince at least half of those guys to reapply and redo the content and keep being a part of the community. Don't separate yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's not what we're about. We're not trying to exclude you, man. It's just that we can't put every movie on. That's, that's the deal. It's not the deal with other film festivals where they go, you just put your mates on. Like, yeah. It's not like yeah. that at all. It's, it's, it's literally the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. I've had mates that have entered. In fact, I think I've entered Maine the West like eight or eight or nine times. I've only ever gotten on, I've only ever gotten in four times. Like, yeah, I don't right. even get into my yeah. own festival, yeah. man. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, right. that's how yeah. honest it is. Like, um, but essentially, like when you look at the winners, like it's great. You know, it's great that people win. Like having having someone like yourself that's won awards at these festivals uh, is great. But um, what I find is the best thing mm-hmm. is getting that content on that screen. You've already won. If you if you've got bums on a seat watching your stuff, yeah, you've already won. Yeah. Totally. The, the the glass square is great, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's what it's about, right? You you're trying to tell a story, mm. have listeners in there, and viewers. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I see, yeah, so I I do get what you're saying. I think it's with the rise of all these kind of streaming services. You know, everyone's mm. having all these. Uh, ways of watching different content and you know netflix has such a large kind of portion of it that is world movies Mm. um there's a lot of korean stuff in there you know a lot of stuff from europe Mm. Um, i think because before like without the streaming services you know people there was only really abc or sbs you know Mm. they only had those two choices or world movies on foxtel as well yeah, yeah. well some Foxtel. people couldn't afford Foxtel and they wouldn't have that well I couldn't afford it but I had it <laughs> <laughs> oh, <there you> go. <laughs> back to that pirating yeah. thing again yeah. quite a funny story about that I'll tell so, you <laughs> but um yeah so so, so they the would turn to these channels and then you know one specific thing would be on you know that they'll they probably hate it and then you know move on but like with you know Netflix or, a little bit more yeah, yeah, yeah a little, sure. bit, little bit more 
yeah, with Netflix or anything like that, they could pick, you know, which is great. I think, um, I think that's really important uh, to kind of have this kind of next phase in cinema. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was saying before. That's that's the point I was getting to before. Like newsreels mm-hmm. used to be in the cinema, and then TV happened, and TV um, had like film lots being knocked down. Like the film industry was decimated because of TV. And you can imagine when radio was around, when cinema came out, radio was decimated. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You get to the point where TV came out and then they realised that there was a, a shortfall in content. You could only make half hour episodic content for TV because it's set up in a way that's consumed in the home. Mm-hmm. It's hard to put a movie on. You could have a midday movie, you could have a nighttime movie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. What do you call it? A marionette? Bayonet? Oh, uh, marionette. Uh, 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 marionette, no. Ma- matinee, matinee, matinee. matinee. Yeah, I got there. What did I go through? Bayonet, marionette. Shit, man, that was violent. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you know, matinee is this sort of thing, right? But essentially, the rest of the content mm-hmm. is half hour bite size, mm-hmm. and then they put the news on TV. There's no new, no need to go to the cinema. In fact, one of the things that drew people to the cinema was the hot weather, because they had, they were the first buildings in the city to have air conditioning. Oh right, because <laughs> yeah. they, they they would actually advertise at the front of the cinema. Air conditioned. Mm. You know, oh, I could go to the pool. I can go watch a movie. Not everyone likes going to the pool. Yeah, you know? cool. Yeah. So they had this. They had a. Di- it was a different way to market it. Um, but then TV came out, decimated it. But then film rose again. And then there's this going of to and fro of good content in films, and you can see it happening. Like in the late seventies, like films were awesome. At the late eighties, films were awesome. Mid nineties, films were awesome. Um, early 2000s films were awesome. They picked up again in around, you know, um, the 2010s, early 2010s. But there's these periods where films are like shit. Mm-hmm. They're just garbage, mm-hmm. right? They go through these ebb and flows. But um, how many people go to the cinema now? Because yeah, TV would rise. Films rise back up because now they offer other things. They try to market differently. Gold class. Mm-hmm. You get the you get a meal, get a beer, you get, yeah. the, you get treated mm-hmm. well, you get a red carpet treatment. You go in there, right? So they're not just selling the film, they're selling the experience. It's gone back to that air con thing. It's not just about the film, it's about the experience of sitting in a nice cool room uh, mm-hmm. and watching content. Um, but when streaming services came out, DVDs, like when you know, how many people buy DVDs now? Like I collect DVDs. I haven't yeah. bought one in at least three years. You know, I right. collect them. Yeah, like I, have, right. I have about, what, four or 5,000 of them. Wow. Well, I've got a lot of DVDs. And... Uh, I don't remember the last time I ran it through the Blu-ray. Like, I remember I had a Blu-ray player that played multi-zone because not every DVD you can get in Australia. You had to buy it overseas. Oh, okay. And you couldn't watch it on your DVD player because it was Zone 4. And this... Look, man, let me go conspiracy on you. Let me go conspiracy on you, bro. Okay, so... I was overseas and... uh, No, I bought the film... Um, Blade Trinity, you know, you know, the, mm-hmm, you know the, mm-hmm. the the Trinity series. Oh, sorry, the Blade series, which is ironic because Blade was the first, um, Mar- not Marvel, but I think it's Marvel. Yeah, Marvel. But the first like um superhero uh-huh. film that started off all these franchises, right? It was the first one that succeeded at it. Um, but Blade Trinity, uh, when the movie starts, they go to get Dracula because they ran out of story content, so they're going back to the old. We're going to bring Dracula into this vampire yeah. story. <laughs> and uh, when I bought it originally, it said um, sometime in the future. You know how when, the, when you do sci fi and they put up the little blurb? Mm-hmm. You know, 25 years later or in this country. And it said, in Iraq, middle of the desert, essentially. I went, okay, so it's in Iraq. And then I went and I was overseas and I bought a DVD, the same DVD, because I didn't bring it with me, and I needed, I was overseas for quite some time, and I'm like, oh, it's $3, and it's a pirated version, like, mm-hmm. how bad can it be? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then it said Syria, uh, somewhere in the Syrian desert, and I'm like, why would you change that? Like, mm-hmm. as the filmmaker, why would you put it on the front of the film? Because most films, right, they always have a bad guy, right? There's always, you know, you've got the seven stories that have always been told in history. Rags to riches, overcoming the monster, yada, yada, mm-hmm. right? Comedy, tragedy, all of these things. Um, but uh, why would you change, as a filmmaker, where the Dracula originated from? Like, 
because and the only reason I can think of it is that it's political, right? Because the Iraq war was happening, and they go, mm-hmm. well, we'll put Dracula in Iraq because then people will see that Dracula came from Iraq. Iraq bad, right? This is knuckle dragging yeah. right here. Yeah. Here's the bad guy, Iraq bad, right? But then um, the war in Syria started up, and during the release of that film, someone somewhere changed that text from Iraq to Syria. Oh. And because yeah. we champion bad guys, right? You're like you can do it since like uh, 1940s films all the way up to the 60s. It's always the Nazis. Nazis, right? Nazis everywhere. Mm-hmm. And then the bad guy shifted to um, Russians. Was Russians were everywhere. Was Russians in every James Bond film you could ever see. Yeah. And then it moved from the Russians to um, Islamophobia. So it was all about terrorists taking over planes and all this sort of thing. And, you know, there's lots of studies out on that. But I just found it really profound between three copies of one film that I have. I've still got them. Mm-hmm. I can show you. That the three different... I can't remember the other country. It may have been... Um, I think one of them was Egypt. And that was during the... You know, because it, obviously Iraq was what it was. And then Syria sort of flared up. And then Egypt also flared up as well. So I have a copy of three films of the same same story that have three different places where Dracula came from. <laughs> and then you look at DVD zoning, mm-hmm. right? Because then you'd have zone four, zone five, zone six. You know, in English terms, um, movies made in Europe that are for Europe release. Your uh, uh, African release, Australian release, um, uh, Australasian, right? And all of those three films that I have the same film have the different bad guy location. And then I start to think, this is where I get conspiracy theory about. I go, why would you change it between those zones? And why would you zone DVDs anyway? What's the use of zoning a DVD unless you're trying to segregate markets? And if you're trying to segregate markets, is it totally fiduciary in nation? Is it totally in 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 ideas? Is it totally about capitalism, or is it actually about politics? Why are they zone DVDs? Then I started thinking even crazier: is the same Trinity that plays on Netflix the same bad guy in Australia than it is in America? Did they change it for that as well? Are streaming services different in each country about how they put out political content? And my guess is if they were doing it with DVDs, why wouldn't they do it with streaming services? It's a crazy idea. Oh, maybe. That, that, Come on closer to the mic, man. Don't, don't, don't lose the mic on me. Don't lose the mic on me. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. I mean, there, there is a, an American version of Netflix. Mm. You know? Um, Bigger catalogue. Yeah, yeah. It's so. Because remember, know. you had the hack for... Did you have the no. Uh, VPN? No. You did VPN it? <laughs> when I had the VPN for Netflix before they blocked it out, it was a way bigger catalogue. Oh, right. It's huge. Because you run through, instead of running through your set top box, run it through your computer, mm-hmm. like I do through the projector, mm-hmm. change VPN, American login. Oh, right. Different catalogue altogether. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, well, because you might, I don't know if you, you may be too young to remember, there was LimeWire. Do you know what LimeWire Yeah, is? I remember LimeWire. You remember LimeWire? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm not so old. I'm not so old. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it was LimeWire, and then you obviously had um, Kickass Torrents, oh, yeah. and then uh, Pirate Bay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. After that, they had the um, pirate streaming services. The biggest one I used was Let Me Watch This dot com, and the reason I found that was by typing Let Me Watch This. <laughs> oh right. Let Me Watch This dot com ran through different servers, which were streaming pirated services, which I found amazing. I missed the streaming pirated services. Here's the really weird thing. Netflix got a re- uh, released in Australia, right? Everyone's like, great, get a Netflix login. I go, why would I do that when I've got pirated streaming services that have a bigger catalogue? Why would I do that? Um, and I was a student at the time, couldn't fucking afford it. But um, aside from that, I, I'd prefer, I prefer now that I, I subscribe and buy the software, I prefer it. But there's a time in my life where I couldn't afford it and it was actually more vibrant than what I pay for which is the irony in all of this story, um, through Put Locker and Let Me Watch This, you could watch anything, any movie ever made was on there. Any movie that came out before it was released in the cinema was on there. Yeah. Right? Better than Pirate Bay. Better than Kick-Ass Torrents, right? And um, Netflix came out, Stan came out. This site was still easily accessible from Australia. As soon as Fox Now came out, the day... I can tell you the day because I remember seeing it on the news and I went to go and go into my illegal streaming service and it wasn't available. They blocked all of the illegal streaming services the day 
that Fox now came out. Coincidence? I don't know. <laughs> but then you extrapolate that idea out to, why change the title on these movies? Why change the bad guy's location in these movies? And you start to realise that there's something nefarious going on there. I don't understand it. I don't pretend to understand it. But I can certainly say that something's rotten in Denmark. There ain't, there's something wrong with that. That's not a typo. It's not a typo. It's a deliberate uh, action by somebody. And it wasn't the filmmaker. Certainly wasn't the filmmaker going, yeah, Dracula came from Iraq, for sure. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it is interesting. It's, it's slightly propaganda, right? In this whole thing. Then you realise what isn't propaganda. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you look at the definition of propaganda, right? And then you realise it is all propaganda. Uh, I can get. Po- I don't want to get too political, but if you want to look at some uh, some uh, bias, all you got to do is look at the election that's going on at the moment. Mm-hmm. You'll see that bias clearly. Yeah. They clearly want their bad boy liberal to get back in at all costs. Like they're really mm-hmm. pulling out all stops on it. And I'm a swing voter too. Like I don't give a shit. Like mm-hmm. I'll vote for the thing that's more av- advantageous for me as an individual and, yeah. and as for my family. Yeah. yeah. Anyone, like most people do. Unless you donkey vote and don't give a shit and just draw a big dick on the fucking vote form. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fuck you, government. Uh, yeah. No, I, I certainly make my vote count, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally a swing voter. Uh, voted Liberal, voted Labor. Voted both of those throughout my life, but I think, you know, uh, I, I think I'd be swaying towards Labor at the moment because I'm in the arts industry and I want that arts yeah. funding, right? Yeah. But then you go, well, I want that tax cut too, but I've already got the tax cut. Give me the funding. Yeah, yeah. So you got to evaluate yeah, it, yeah. evaluate it for oneself, and 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 it's totally a, a unapologetic capitalist idea, mm-hmm. and that's all that's all thing of democracy anyway, right? But certainly looking at the content, you go vested interests for sure. Not that I understand those vested interests. You're like I'm sure it's about mining. Sure it's about the environment. Sure it's about you know um, the public purse and how it's been operated. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Um, Look, actually, big shout out to uh, Scotty Belshaw. Uh, we will be doing this episode um, for the election on the uh, 13th. So we'll have it out by uh, the election uh, with Scotty Belshaw. We'll be talking politics and going absolutely bananas. Um, but um, yeah, no, what were you. So, so composition, got the future. Um, what else got. Were you doing. What study were you doing before? Were you doing study before composition? Like doing music? Well, sh- straight out of high school, I went to the Australian Institute of Music to study performance. Oh, performance. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, for some reason, I thought you were doing performance art. Oh, no, no, no. Well, no, it's very it's, different. No, no. So, <laughs> it's called, you know, the Bachelors of Music in Contemporary Performance in the, the bass guitar. Oh, I see. Yeah, now I got it. Yeah, now I got it. Yeah. Now I got it. Um, yeah, no, bass players, man. Um, uh, very, very rare. Um, but like I I don't want to uh, go too deep into um, tracks and whatnot. but how much like do you do you do the orchestra instruments at all or is it all just um, programmed and do you you play other instruments while you do composition no it's all programmed Mm -hmm. it's all programmed obviously you know you'll play the keyboard Mm -hmm. um, the MIDI keyboard so you gotta do you gotta have a basic understanding of how the keyboard works you know obviously um, and also with the instruments that you write, mm. also have a a good enough understanding of it so you know how to write for that instrument. Wow, okay. Because yeah. when, when someone like me thinks about the orchestra, I think, you know, so this dude knows how to play violin. And you go, well, do they know how to finger pluck and, and, and to, str- you know, to strum a bow? I don't even know what you call that. <laughs> um, operate a bow on a, uh, on a stringed mm-hmm. instrument. But... Having that understanding, so you need to ha- have a firm understanding of string instruments, woodwind instruments, brass instruments. Well, ideally, but a lot of people come from different kind of backgrounds and they kind of fall into composition in different ways. Mm. Um, you know, with with me, since I studied studied orchestration in AIM as well, I kind of knew how, you know, the instruments of the orchestra worked. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that gave me like an advantage, I guess. But I do know some other people who... You know, I haven't studied music. They, you know, they come fresh off another career path, mm. and then they they would use, you know, their ears to work out how that that instrument works, and they write for it differently. Yeah, autographic yeah. thinking, right? Mm-hmm. Because um, I, I heard this um, I can't remember where I heard this report from, 
But um, because like I remember things that I hear very well, and I'm very good at parroting them. I'm very good at imitating and impersonating people, Mm -hmm. and impersonating voices uh, specifically, and getting that pitch and tone right, and getting the mouth position right. Um, karaoke, love karaoke because mm-hmm. I've got two options in karaoke for someone like myself. I can do it the way the artist did it, or I can do it yeah. my way. Yeah, I always prefer my way, mm-hmm. but it depends on your crowd. Uh, you know, when you're doing NXS, people want to hear um, Hutchison, right? They want to hear how he did it. Yeah, they don't. They're not interested in the way that you do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like for instance, a good one that I like doing is uh, lately, especially during COVID, I've been doing a lot of uh, practice because I've got a, like mic set up upstairs. The neighbours know it very well. Um, everything from heavy metal to Otis Redding, right? Mm-hmm. Like I've been doing mm-hmm. like you know, sitting on the dark of the bay, <laughs> yeah. watching the tide roll away, right? Yeah. But then I go, I'm going to do a metal version. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was sitting on the dock of the bay. And I was doing it for some someone earlier, like, man, that's fucking awesome, man. When you want to do some band practice, man? I'm like, yeah, man. I'm always keen to get into a studio and jam with some some cool ombres, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, especially when you work with a drummer and a guitarist, man, it's the best. Like, um, do you have that experience a lot, like working with like um, you know, different musicians, or you're just fully solo artist? Uh, no, I, I've always liked working with other musicians. You know that. They'll always give you a different perspective on your music. You know, if if you were to get them to play your music, mm. um, you know, a, a, every musician musician is so different. It's always great to um, get them to try their own ideas. Yeah. You know, their own interpretations of your music um, or any other other music, like you know what, what you said with the oldest reading mm. track. Um, you know, same goes with producers and directors. Oh, really? Yeah, um, even um, cinematographers. Mm. You know, I think you know with you know going back to campesinos, you know I I've got most of my ideas just by seeing how Matthias edit the whole film and how um, Miller shot the whole thing. Yeah, you get what I mean. So yeah, everyone involved in art. You know, has has their own kind of um, their own stake, right? Sorry, their own stake, their own investment in it. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And I don't, yeah, I mean that from a uh, intellectual, artistic point of view. Your own stake, like your own. This is me in this project. Yeah, or or this is me telling this part of the story. Yeah, yeah. this story that er- er- everyone you know I- agrees on. Yeah, I found a correlation, man. Maybe you can dig this, right? Because like being a musician and being a filmmaker. Because like my, my you know, before I was a filmmaker, I was a um, you know a young heavy metal dude that was screaming into a microphone, whose primary job was to scare folk. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, absolutely love it, still love it. But uh, I found a correlation between cinematographers and guitarists. Right? So a guitarist is very much like a cinematographer in attitude. <laughs> a lead actor or a director is very much like a vocalist. Very much like the front man in a, mm-hmm, in a band mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or a lead guitarist in a little bit of his way as well. But a drummer and a bass guitarist are more like an editor and a composer. Yeah. I, fan- like, I, I don't mean as in like yeah. artistic output. Yeah, yeah. I mean as in personality. Oh, right. Yeah. Like the way they look at the world. Or, or even their, their, their role in, in general because um, you know, the drummer and the bass player anchors the whole... And, no, and they don't get any thanks. No one knows a bass player, man. Like, yeah. I just screwed it up tonight. Um, what were the two bass players we were talking about tonight? Yeah. yeah. It was... Uh, um, Les Claypool and Marcus Miller. Yeah, Marcus Miller. Okay, so Marcus Miller is the jazz bass guitarist. Mm. And Les Claypool. Oh, too many puppies. Yeah, absolutely love Primus. But um, yeah, totally. Yeah, for, for someone that's a music fan, I just confused two bass guitarists straight away. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I guess... And the drummers are also un, uh, um, forgettable as well. Like no one remembers the drummers, man. They always remember the lead singer and the and the and the um, lead guitar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the rhythm guitar is kind of like the guy that has the ability to be the director and the actor, but has chosen a different job. <laughs> <laughs> or it's just too stoned. <laughs> Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I think. <laughs> look, man. If people are adverse to the idea of weed, right? You've got to think about this, right? Okay. Um, um, uh, the Beatles, right? Mm. We all live in a yellow submarine, right? 
they, this band changed how we do music. Changed how we looked at fandom. It changed how we uh, um, uh, interface with artists and the crowd. It became sensational in a very big way, very quickly. Um, uh, Elvis was like the first pop star, right? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was no one before. And these guys were like the, the trailblazers of all these ideas. But, you know, um, you can't write a song like We All Live in a Yellow Submarine without smoking a little bit of weed. It's just not possible. Uh, I think Bill Hicks said it the best, right? Absolutely. And I, I, I think I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a religious person, but if I'm ever to pray to anybody, I would pray to Bill Hicks, right? <laughs> um, you know, you know, never robbed anyone, never raped anyone, never um, lost one fucking job, and uh, got high as fuck. But you, you, I think it's, it's it, like everything. You shouldn't be forced to do anything. You shouldn't be peer pressured to do anything. But if you can do anything that enhances you in a way that um, isn't harmful to anyone and especially yourself, um, you should be allowed to do it. And if you are recalcitrant to that idea, if you rebut that idea, and if you like the Beatles, throw away your LPs, man, because that music came out of a place of rebellion and that rebellion was bought uh, was bought out of um, certain factors and one of those was smoking weed. That's just a fact. You can't get around it because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you can't write a, you can't write the lyrics to the Yellow Submarine, right? Yeah, without yeah. being stoned, it's <laughs> not possible. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, there's a whole craze with you know psychedelia, mm. you know that that type of genre coming after that. Totally. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, well, I think well, 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 psychedelics, right? Like, um, with my own experience with psychedelics, we don't need to go too deep into it, but, um, uh, I find that. If you've ever had a psychedelic experience, we all have an ad. This is how I sound. This is how I look. This is how I present myself to um, people I'm attracted to. This is how I uh, re- rebut people I uh, disagree with. This is how I um, detest something. This is how I accept something. When you're in a psychedelic experience, all of that shit doesn't matter. It just gets eroded away. Mm-hmm. I, like I've... I've watched people that are freaked out because they've watched their ad melt away. Because they realise that the ad doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like, um, the, what matters is your human experience. Mm-hmm. And, it, and you know, like, for instance, people uh, that... Hold on, can I stop you? The Ooh. camera just cut out. <laughs> Man, okay, like, this has been a calamity of um, uh, technical errors. Are we rolling, bro? Yep. Calamity of technical <laughs> errors. We were on a crescendo right there. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, psychedelic experiences eroding the idea of an ad and, um, that's where people freak out because if you're not comfortable with yourself, how can, how can anyone else be comfortable with you? Mm-hmm. And that's where that paranoia comes into it. And I, I think the fear is the best thing because the fear shows you and you have two options, You uh, three options actually. Mm-hmm. You can let, let fear define you. You can let fear strengthen you or you can even let fear change you right and then that's what a psychedelic experience will do for you. you you will do one of those three things but my advice to anyone having a psychedelic experience with someone that is freaking out the first thing that you should tell them is that you're on acid man because <laughs> they'll go oh yeah yeah that's why I'm freaking out <laughs> like yeah that's why you're freaking out man you're on drugs bro that's why you're freaking <laughs> out it's okay we love you mm. and, and that's the key is love man like a lot of people will say that um, it's money that makes the world go round it's just not true it's not true at all it's love that yeah. makes the world go round I can prove it I can prove that makes it, that love makes the world go round 7 billion, 7 billion people on the planet where do they come from? <laughs> yeah. Most of those relationships were out of love. Most of them. Most, yeah. There's exceptions to the rule. There's some heinous fucking shit out there, but that's the small percentage. Most yeah. of those 7 billion people came out of an idea of two people loving each other. Mm-hmm. That's where they came from. Mm-hmm. It wasn't money that generated that. No. It was love that generated that. And if you look at the course of human endeavor with the Wright brothers trying to figure out how to fly, I don't think they were flying planes that flew 12, 15 metres, whatever it was, with the intent of being bad to society. I don't think the Wright brothers ever intended for 
you know, people to fly over cities and drop bombs. Mm. I don't think that's yeah. what was in their head at all. Yeah. yeah. Someone who had a capitalist mind had that going on. Or someone mm. had a dictator idea mm. and wanted power and control yeah. had that idea. It wasn't someone that goes, man, we can put music in everyone's pocket. A thousand songs, man. Yeah. Endless content yeah. that you can watch. These ideas aren't born out of out of out of money. They're born out of love, man. I really believe that. And the more that we understand that, the more that we can accept each other. The more that we can understand that there is actually no such thing as difference. If you if you if you here's the strange thing, in colour mm-hmm. correction in film, right? Mm-hmm. Everyone's grey. Did you know that? Is it? Everyone's oh. grey. Oh, cool. We yeah. all have the same. We all have the same skin tone, man. There's a little bit of variation between, you know, yeah. um, um, uh, African people to um, um, uh, to Asian people to uh-huh. um, Anglo-Saxon, right? But uh-huh. we're all in the same band with the color. The only reason that our skin has a hue is because of the blood that runs through our veins, yeah. which is yeah. also the same color, <laughs> yeah. right? Exactly. So, it's scientifically, man, yeah. we're all the same. Mm-hmm. That's my point. Mm-hmm. DNA, break us down. Break us down to the molecule, all the same. Um, it's it's our indifferences that actually make us the same. It's a it's a it's a paradox, all right? Yeah, yeah. But um, those that try to create wedges, those that create separation, <coughs> have a financial reason to do so. Oh yeah, of course. And if it wasn't yeah. financial, they wouldn't be doing it because they they believe that money makes the world go round, but it's not. It's love that makes the world go around. It's generosity. It's, in fact, cooperation that makes it all happen. If we don't cooperate, none of this shit happens, man. Um, you can go to all of the um, movements through the earth. Um, all of the... <coughs> sorry, I'm dying in, dying in, a, in, in pieces here. It's all of the, all of the uh, um, civil movements, man, have all been valid. They really have, like, um, from the civil rights movement to the Me Too movement, man. These things are so fucking important. They really are. And they're not driven fully by economics. There's an economic factor, but they're not driven by that. Mm-hmm. It's just driven by acceptance. Mm-hmm. I just want you to love me, man. And I just want to love you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's not complicated beyond that. Yeah. Well, and some people find it complicated. <laughs> well, they haven't done psychedelics, bro. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't yeah. found themselves. They haven't eroded the ad. They haven't let the ad fall away, mm-hmm. and they, mm-hmm. because like you know, this is how much money I have in my bank account. This is the house size of my house. The people that, um, you know, why do people buy BMW? Why? Mm. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry about that, guys. People don't buy BMW because they like BMWs. They buy BMW because they go, look at me driving this BMW. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why they buy it. Yeah. Uh, you know, the cool cars that I've ever driven in my life, I didn't buy them because of the badge that was on them. I bought them because of the feel that it gave me driving them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, you don't buy a BMW because of like, well, don't get me wrong, like, you know, twin turbo, V8, traveling down the highway, I'm sure it's a good feeling. Mm-hmm. But you can get that in different cars. You don't have to get that specifically in a BMW or a Mercedes. You buy those two cars for one reason. Yeah. It's not about how I've achieved. It's how I've perceived to achieved. And none of that actually matters. Mm. You're born into this world alone. You die in this world alone. Exactly. Uh, in this life, you are all in. Mm-hmm. You're not getting out alive. It's not possible. It's literally exactly. impossible. Yeah, yeah. It's literally impossible. But these are all acid ideas. These are all <laughs> mushroom psychedelic ideas. And here's a weird thing. This is the thing that spins me out, man. Um, if you look through the animal and plant kingdom, mm-hmm. the closest relationship of plants to humans is mushrooms. Isn't that fucking trippy? <laughs> yeah, right. That's true, man. That's true. Check that out, Wade. Can you pull that up? Relationship to mushrooms and humans. Um, you, the uh, the genetics in mushrooms are the closest aligned to humans than any other life force. Uh, you know, between the plant and animal kingdom. Oh, right. Between the plant and animal kingdom. Oh. That's why pharmacology with mushrooms works really well with humans. Mm. Strippy <laughs> shit, man. What have we got? What have we got? We are nearly 100% um, alike as humans, equally closely related to mushrooms. Only a few tiny changes in our DNA structure set it as a part, given us a variation in eye, skin, and hair color. We are technically all related and similar to mushrooms. True story. Wow. 
<laughs> How weird's that? Yeah, that's pretty weird. It's pretty weird, man. But it doesn't. It makes sense, right? Because if you think about it, the um, no, we've got to wrap it up soon. I know I'm running out of time. <laughs> but um, you know, going back to bacteria forming on the earth, right? Mm-hmm. And then it turns into the um, plant kingdom, and mm-hmm. that plant kingdom turns into an animal kingdom. Well, we came from the mushroom. Yeah. We evolved from the mushroom, man. Well, I didn't know that. It's fucking well, I, I trippy. Learned something. <laughs> it's fucking trippy. I, like, I can't get my head around that. Um, yeah, uh, the, the, don't get me wrong. There's other things that we're related to. Like, it, it goes back to archaea, and archaea splits into bacteria, and then bacteria splits into these other forms of life. And uh, here we are, man. We were the shrews that were in the mountains when the dinosaurs were reigning, right? Mm. You know? Yeah. You know, you look at parkour and you go, yeah, man, I could see the shrew. <laughs> 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 well, on that offensive note, let's get the hell out of here, man. Um, <laughs> look, so, um, uh, Darren Lim, uh, where can we check out your content online? Uh, well, I post mostly on my um, website, uh, so www.darrenlimmusic.com, mm-hmm. um, and in my Instagram, uh, Darren Lim Music. So pretty easy at just check, music. Yeah. check out Darren Lim <laughs> online man and if you guys need uh, some uh, film composition done for your movies if you need a, uh, um, a decent mus- musician that can work with 200 channels doing an orchestra <laughs> this is your guy um, but man thank you so much for being on the yeah, show I really enjoyed our time together today cool thank you yeah no yeah. worries man and you guys have been watching the pagey train of course you can find us anywhere you can find podcasts but let me rattle them off you can find us on YouTube iHeartRadio Spotify um, Apple iTunes and fuck man anywhere bro but if you find us anywhere don't forget to subscribe tick like and tick uh, for all notifications you've been watching the pagey train we'll see you next time one of my most favourite outros ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool, man. That was cool, man.